Michelle, here we are. <laughs> My friends from Austin, Texas. We're chilling in London. We're highfalutin. We're fancy. We're here overseas across the right. Atlantic. Can we, you believe we had to come here to actually get yeah, no, right. <laughs> get on each other's schedule? <laughs> yeah, that's to- it's totally funny. It's crazy too, like scheduling in when the uh, you know the Apple calendars mm-hmm. want to sync up and stuff. And there's all these different time zones. Like I'll be in California, you guys are in Austin. Now we're over here. It's very confusing, but we made it. Yes. Uh, so you're the founders of one of the most, I think, long-standing and biggest and most successful, wildly successful, well-known conferences in the health and wellness space called paleo fx Mm -hmm. so i'm going to start at the obvious jumping off point what was the first uh, birth of that idea and what was like the first step in making it happen a psychotic Uh, break i think was the first step (laughs) all great uh, things uh, come out of a psychotic break yeah insanity we yeah insanity um actually um there's kind of a two-fold um backstory to paleo fx um, the original story of Paleo FX actually uh, started about 10 years ago. Um, our daughter, Brittany, was killed in a car accident three days before her 23rd birthday and a week before her college graduation. And uh, we held her first memorial service on what would have been her 23rd birthday. And at that memorial service, there were um, almost 700 people in attendance. And um, they had a receiving line for us. And Keith and I stood there and received most of the people that were at that service. And they were telling us how Brittany had changed their lives in very specific and profound ways. It wasn't just this you know, superficial, oh, she changed my life. It was, she said this, or she did that. And um, it was a little overwhelming for us, very humbling, of course, because in that moment, just, you know, 72 hours after you find out your child has died, um, you're standing there with all these people telling you how wonderful she is. It was very humbling. And we immediately knew that we needed to do something to carry on her legacy. So um, that was 2009. Uh, She was killed May 2nd, 2009. Her birthday is May 5th. And um, fast forward, 2000, August of 2011, we um, we kind of thought her, what her um, legacy would be was was gonna be something completely different. We had no idea what it would ultimately be. And um, one of the things uh, that we kept talking about was how she was a very gifted and beautiful musician and singer. She was a worship and music ma- ministry major. She had planned to be a minister and work in the mission field. And uh, she had all of these beautiful gifts, and those were just definitely not ours. So we were trying to figure out, how do you do that? How do you carry on somebody's legacy when this was what their gift was, and this is not your gift? And then we just decided we needed to operate in our gifts, and that was that we knew food and nutrition and health and wellness and fitness. And so um, we fast forward to August 2011, we are at the inaugural ancestral health symposium, which is a very decidedly academic symposium. And um, we were, Keith was speaking at that symposium. And when we were on the runway at LAX, getting ready to come back home, at the time, we were partners in a very small, um, but growing gym chain that was boutique style training gyms uh, for one on one in very small group coaching. And we had a lot of clients, a lot of uh, people that we were coaching through the process of um, getting their health back and getting their nutrition and everything on on track. And when we started talking, and I'm a trained chef, so um, we start talking through all of this and I was like, okay, you know what they could do? They could really change this and it would be really great as if they could show people how to cook foods, if they could show people how to do the the movements and the fitness and the all of these things, if they could do all of these like hands on things. And Keith looks at me and he's like, it's an academic conference. They're not changing that. And then he had he went, we should just probably do it. <laughs> I was like, Okay, well, so Pillow FX was born on the runway at LAX in August of 2011. And by October, Insanity had completely set in and we had decided we were going to do it. And on March 14th, 2012, which happens to be our anniversary, we launched Paleo FX. Really? Yeah, the, but the translation of we should probably do that, Michelle didn't know this at the time, was that you should probably do this. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Well, <laughs> anyway, Which is what it wound that. up, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, dude. So, uh, and why does it have the letters FX Oh, Man. interesting story there. So just um, brainstorming ideas, trying to trying to 
get together a a brand, a, a marketing, an icon, something that we could relate to um, as a poli-sci major and decidedly not in any shape, form, whatever, math, dude. <laughs> I, somewhere in the back of my mind, this FX thing came up as functional. And uh, I remembered okay. that, oh, functional. And that's exactly what we wanted to convey was that we are a functional event, not just theory, but how do you put this theory into an everyday life practice? And I just kind of threw it out there. It's like FX, functional. Yeah. So were you guys early adopters? I mean, if you're going to the symposium on ancestral health, is that, does that have anything to do with the Weston Price thing or is that a different one? Actually, no. <clears throat> I mean, Weston Weston Price obviously is a foundational, a lot of paleo, but right. um, honestly, it we became paleo in 2004 and 2005. Oh, damn. And you guys were old school, early geez, adopters. Man. I we're guess not as early as the original Paleolithic people. But no. <laughs> <laughs> we got there as fast as we could. Yeah. So, um, it's How many funny. years late? 60,000 years? What is it? <laughs> right. It's a little late to the game, but... Just, yeah. Um, it's funny because actually uh, who got us involved in paleo was Rob Wolf and Art Devaney because they were on an old school forum back in the dial up days. Um, and they were all talking about this paleo thing and celiac and all of that. And what was interesting to Keith was he recognized the symptoms that Rob was talking about were my symptoms. And I had been diagnosed with early um, with uh, early onset rheumatoid arthritis, misdiagnosis, by the way, um, IBS, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, every kind of conceivable really? autoimmune thing yeah. that was going on. It was happening in my body. And what what was interesting is um, it took him about a year to convince me to try this. And, and I'll, let me go back just a tiny bit. Um, as I said, I'm a trained chef. My specialty was Italian. So I oh, made my bummer, own, right? <laughs> yeah, total bummer, oh. pizza and pasta dough. And so it was really difficult to, um, I didn't come into paleo in a happy way. I came in kicking and screaming. And what's odd about the whole thing is, is that I was paleo for probably about three weeks when everything went away, all the symptoms were gone. And then, uh, probably what? three weeks, three mm-hmm. weeks. Uh, I was done. I had no more symptoms. I literally was sick every single time I ate. And the thing is, is that we didn't have we would have considered ourselves eating very healthy because we ate at home almost all nights. I cooked most of our food. The only thing that we ever really did like where we would go and have junk food or processed food is when our kids would be like, it was just going to be a late night and our kids had, you know, um, sports or what have you going on. Or, you know, Brittany was in, in choir and drama and all of that. So if we had anything like that, where it limited our ability to cook at home, then we would maybe, you know, hit um, Jersey Mike's was one of the our favorites. We would hit Jersey Mike's. I don't so, know what it is, but it sounds unhealthy. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a, like a deli type, yeah. you know, Subway sandwich okay, kind of thing. Right, right. But it was all, everything was all homemade. They brought all, you know, made all their stuff. So that was probably the, the max of our junk food. Okay, chips occasionally in the house, occasionally some cookies. Most of the time I made my own st- stuff. So we had our own, but so many refined carbohydrates. That was what the real serious problem was, was there's just too much carbohydrates. And then for me, not Keith so much, or even the kids, I really had a horrible sweet tooth. So I had, a, I would drink a lot of Dr. Pepper, which was, uh, that was hardest to get rid of, by the way. And, um, but literally three weeks and everything was gone once I went paleo. And then um, I was a food writer. I wrote and developed recipes for a number of food websites. I didn't stop that at that point because I was in this like state of denial. Like some point I'm going to figure out how to put all this stuff back into my diet. But I was really pissed that I had to get rid of these foods that I loved just to be healthy. And so, um, yeah, so it was an interesting dilemma there. And it took um, a few weeks later, I had been paleo for about six weeks and uh, our son plays a select baseball and they were out of season for about 12 weeks. So we hadn't seen any of the parents or any of the kids or anything. And, you know, when you're on a standard American diet, the sad diet, you, as a woman, you yo-yo a lot. And so your sizes in your closet or anywhere, mine was anywhere from a six to a 12. And um, uh, when I would diet to really lose weight, it was a process that 
everybody in the family paid for. You know what I mean? I was just miserable. Right. It's just calorie restriction and the whole, it was all the stuff you're not, you shouldn't do, right? And Kate's like, honey, I, I really wouldn't mind if you put on a few extra pounds. <laughs> you just be nicer. Right, <laughs> right. right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Always that give and take, right? <laughs> yeah. But what was interesting is I had, I started going down in sizes and I hadn't, you know, I didn't notice it because it was normal to go up and down in size. That oh, was okay. normal. Right. So, we, like I said, it was about six weeks into paleo and we're first game, our son's game, we show up and all the parents are showing up and they're like, oh my God, you look amazing. You've lost so much weight. Your skin looks so glow. It's glowing. You look so vibrant. You're just like, what in the world have you done? Well, I hadn't done anything. I definitely didn't diet. I wasn't miserable. I wasn't being restricted. Like, I mean, obviously I was had a, you know, an emotional attachment to some of the foods that I ate, but I wasn't physically hungry, which normally when you diet, you're hungry, hangry, whatever, you know what I mean? And I didn't have any of that. And that was, that for me was the moment that the light bulb went off and I went, oh shit, this is stuff that could help people. Oh my God. I got to do something about that. And Keith says, that's the day the paleo evangelist was born because I'm one of those people that if something works for me, everybody's going to hear about it. And so that's kind of where we ended up getting started. But Wow, cool. And yeah. so being early adopters, um, you know, for I think now at this point, people have a basic idea of what paleo, we'll just, you know, start with the diet part because mm -hmm. I want to really expand into kind of paleo life. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I think that's the root of our whole troubles, especially after the conversation I just had about autism mm -hmm. uh, with the, uh, uh, the woman that you met on the way in. But um, maybe, Keith, could you give us you know, a breakdown? Just pretend like the person listening has never even heard of a paleo diet. Like, how would you, how would you describe it in its most fundamental terms? Right. So the easiest way to explain it to people is you're eating as close to the land as possible. Right. So, so people kind of get hung up on this term of what is a refined food, right? Because really it, everything's refined. If you're cooking with fire, that is a refined food, right? If you're butchering an animal, um, it, and people can get hung up on those definitions, especially the more academic, you know, will get hung up on that. <laughs> right. right. Uh, or is, like or the, or the word processed too. Processed, I mean, if you shoot yes, a that, deer, you got to right. process the deer. You don't just like walk over and take a bite of hide. <laughs> Right. I mean, you it's, we hope not. Yeah. Well, some might. Maybe some might. maybe my buddy Daniel Vitalis, he might do yeah. that. Yeah. But, um, yeah. But yeah, people get hung up on these terms. But, you know, for us and when we're teaching people who are new and back when we back when we owned the gyms and back when we were teaching people how to do this on the in, and at that time, paleo was like no one knew what that was. It was kind no, of like no gluten, knew what that nobody, term, gluten yeah, no free, one, celiac, nobody knew what that was either. And I would just <clears throat> and so I would I would start off by saying, can we cut? added sugars in your diet out because that's easy for most people to identify an added sugar right you look at the back of a can of soda look at all that sugar in there right and you start to get them to think in that way well what is sugar that's a highly refined food product and so can we take these initial steps to start eliminating these foods and see how you feel and see if you can navigate those michelle brought up emotional attachments people have Emotional attachments to all kinds of things, especially foods. You can have an emotional attachment to a person, to an activity, to whatever. But foods, for whatever reason, because they're, well, the reason is because there is a definite reaction within the body, right? There's a dopamine release. There's all of these things that occur. Um, so, they, so the trick is to get people to eat closer to the land as possible. So if you could, if, if you can harvest it, if you can hunt it, cook it um and, and to get them just to think that way and i think for most people the paleo diet right now the easiest way to think of it is if it comes in a box if it's wrapped if it's all of these things let's try to avoid it and i always say let's try to avoid it because paleo is not a black and white diet and i think that's what hangs people up too is that like i want a prescription i want rules to follow but rules can never be followed over the long term. There's always a breaking point, and people will always default to to what they what they learned previously. I don't know if that answers the question it, really well. It does, but and it, it brings up a couple points sure. too. Uh, I, I like this idea of the emotional attachment because I've noticed that um, 
say you take plant-based food and vegan food and it's always, well, not always, but oftentimes it's mimicking a comfort food. Mm -hmm. So you have fake meats and, you know, like fake jerky and all this kind of stuff. It's like the food that either your body knows it wants or food that you have an emotional attachment to because you grew up eating it and you're comfortable, you know, eating whatever, you know, chicken wings that are made out of some God awful GMO soy or something. And there's an identification to an ideology as well, right? So, you know, you know, vegan vegetarianism for so long, and at least in our country, and I would say worldwide, has been identified with a love of the environment and a love of animal animals and animal husbandry and all of these. And paleo is exactly that, too. We just had a discussion at the, uh, at the um, health optimization event with a, with a woman who was a vegan or vegetarian. I can't remember what her particular leaning was, but she was like, would I be welcome at paleo effects? We're like, absolutely you would be. We agree on 90% of all those other issues. If you want to talk environmentalism, we are all about environmentalism. If you want to talk about proper animal husbandry, we are there. I mean, we might, well, we would disagree on that final step. Can I reconcile within my soul the taking of another entity's life? And I can, and I can justify that. If I, if I show reverence for the animals whose life that I'm taking. Um, and that's how I've justified it in my life. Well, now, maybe the vegan vegetarian can never justify that. I totally get it. That's cool. That's a, that's a spiritual soul conversation that we can have later down the line. But all of these other issues, um, for instance, um, CAFOs, confined animal feeding operations, the vegan vegetarian community and the paleo community, we're all on board on that. We want those eliminated. The environment, absolutely. We want the environment healthy. We want it thriving because that's the underpinning of human life. That's the underpinning of life on earth. Mm-hmm. So how can we best um, nurture that? In our opinion, the best way to nurture that is is packs and just giant roaming herds of hooved animals. That is where the rubber rubber meets the road in soil conservation and soil regeneration. Well, what to do with all these animals now? You know, we feel like they are the cycle of life, just what, just mm-hmm. like what we are. I mean, eventually we're going to go away and we are going to turn, we're all made of stardust, right? Yeah. We're all going to go back into the earth. We're all going to be recycled. Um, they're going to eat us. They're going to eat us. That, we, it's the cycle of life. This it's, is one of the issues too, that I think that there's, um, there can be a little bit of, um, I don't know how much vegans and vegetarians take a look at the fact that um, they just see that animals are sentient beings. Well, plants are too. Right. And so where do you draw the line? Is it because it doesn't have a face? Is it because you think it has no soul? Because I would venture to say that just about everything here has some type of feeling sentience. It's got something there. And the thing is, is that we're all here for each other because we're all ultimately connected. And so I, um, I, so we have, uh, we're, we're working on having a girl come to Paleo FX this year who actually does um, these biospheres where she, the plants actually through their emotions and their moods create music. And it's an incredible. Oh, right. yes. yeah, 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 yeah. I've heard of that. And um, it's really incredible. And I'm like, so it, we know we've had studies going back way, way back. We know that if you talk to a plant or you play music for a plant, the plant gl- grows more. It is no different than we are. That's mm-hmm. how we are. We thrive on connection and communication and all of that. And if the communication is more negative, a plant will actually be depleted. And so we that's all scientifically proven. So it's one of those things. If you feel you can't take the... I totally understand that. And I'm not... Mm-hmm. I'm definitely... And fully support that to, too. Fully support if someone has... That's their moral and that's where they need to stand and that's their value. Totally... It, um, totally respect that. It's when we get into which one's healthier, we have science. We've got lots of it that shows we're far more healthy than having just a vegan and vegetarian diet. And I'm not saying paleo is for everybody. Paleo, um, I, but there's so many different paleo diets. Like there's not just one. So a lot of times a, a vegetarian diet can fall very easily under paleo. Mm-hmm depending on how they do it. Uh, since you guys were quite 
early in your adoption of this uh, diet and lifestyle, what's it looked like in terms of um, the commodity foods that are like labeled paleo from the marketing Ugh. standpoint? You know, I mean, mm. I, 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 I'm pretty much paleo, I guess. I never tried or even learned exactly what right. the guidelines are. I just know if I eat grains, I don't feel good. Right. If I eat gluten, I don't feel good. You know, it's just, there's a few kind of kryptonite foods I avoid. But what I have noticed is that when I go into a grocery store, a health food store, typically the foods that have some kind of paleo logo are going to be in alignment with what makes my body feel mm -hmm. good, right? Mm -hmm. But then there's all kinds of other shit that's out there now. I mean, you, there's like huge paleo sections because of the marketing and the, the monetary, um, you know, motivation there by these even some of the Nabisco and these big companies are getting right. on board with it, you know? So what's it been like to watch the journey of, um, you know, commercial processed foods being labeled paleo and how much of that is bullshit? Well, uh, for, for us, there two sides of the coin there. Right. I mean, super happy about a lot of it because obviously when you have a little bit, bit more mainstream adoption and you start seeing that, then that means that people are being exposed to it that might not have seen it anywhere else. And they're like, Hmm, what's this paleo thing? And then they're going to look into it. The problem is, is that there's no policing of it. There's no making sure that when, and if somebody goes to a package of whatever it is, crackers say, and they pick it up and it says that it's paleo and really in, and when you look at the template of paleo, it doesn't align. That's where it, it gives us a, it can give us a bad name. So there, there's where, you know, we try, that's one of the reasons why paleo effects, we do our best to bring in as many new people into paleo effects every single year as we possibly can, because the more people get educated and know and understand and can really arm themselves with that kind of information. When they go to the grocery store, they are not picking up something and just blindly believing that it is a, a food that um, is paleo, that they're looking for the labels um, that are out there, the different certifications, that type of thing that actually certify that that this has been vetted as a product that is paleo. And so, um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, we are excited to see so many really cool products coming on board, because this is the thing at the end of the day. We know that compliance is one of the biggest issues for any type of diet, lifestyle, whatever, it's going to be compliance. And the easier you make it on somebody to comply and the easier you make it for them to make a switch over from what they're currently eating, which is generally usually sad diet or worse, is that when they have stepping stones to get there where they're not, they just don't feel like a lot of people feel like, oh my God, it's so restrictive. Like I, I can't have any of my Cokes anymore. I can't have any of my whatever it is. If there are these different alternatives that are healthier to get them into the space a lot easier, we are, we actually, you know, embrace that. And we, you know, you know, we're all yes, for victory for that kind of thing. What we don't like seeing is people who come over, who will come over to paleo and think that that's part of the daily diet. Right. It's not. That's the, that's the issue that's concerning. But at the end of the day, people are going to do what they want to do. They're going to eat what they want to eat when they have healthier options and they choose, you know, say they choose Siete chips versus Cheetos, Doritos or Fritos. Amen. I'm mm -hmm. all for that. And I'm, I'm would prefer that they, you know, obviously keep that to a, a you know, a treat and a, and a, an occasional thing. But if their typical thing was eating Cheetos, Doritos or Fritos every single day, them coming over and eating Siete chips doesn't necessarily make them eating a healthy paleo diet. So these are still all treats and cheats and things like that. And we need to still think of them that way. The problem is, is that all of those foods became mainstream every day, every single day foods. But you think about it, when we were kids, if we went to McDonald's, it was a treat. It was a, like you maybe went once a month. It wasn't something that was done on a daily basis through your car. I mean, you went and it was, you know what I mean? Or you went and had something you got to have maybe once every couple of weeks. Your your mom allowed you to pick some kind of, you know, treat at, when you were at the grocery store. And it just wasn't part of mainstream everyday eating. But unfortunately, it became that way 
mostly through marketing, mostly through TV, mostly through ads that are directed at kids on Saturday mornings while they're watching TV and their parents are trying to do whatever um, or sleep in or whatever the case may be. So that's that's the problem is kind of getting everybody to unlearn that that piece and saying, no, these are still sometimes occasional things. And that we, we like to eat. throw in too, the don't let the perfect get in the, the way, way of the good. good. Mm-hmm. Right? <laughs> right, that's, right. that's a very important point to keep in mind. Another right. thing I would add is um, we see this a lot in the gluten-free world too. Well, I would point out that sugar is in fact gluten-free. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. not good for Aspartame you. Is, is it gluten-free? Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So, you know, there, there's an education component to all of this, which we are very keen to, to develop and push forward. Um, but yeah, it, you know, and just those little thumb rules, you know, how close to the earth is a Siete chip? It's a better option, but is it close to the earth? Is it the actual product, the raw product and, you know, cut and diced, sauteed, that kind of thing? No, it's not. So that kind of gives you an idea of where it falls on the healthy spectrum. And I think just those thumb rules, can I eat as close to the land as possible? I noticed most times I noticed when, uh, I was looking at one of your pamphlets or something at the event last year and um, something about the guidelines for the vendors Mm -hmm. and you have these rules if people want to bring foods into the property and they want to, you know, get a booth, like here's the list of the 10 or 20 or whatever there were, like what are some of those things that are just like, no fucking way, this is not meat art. 52, actually. Are you serious? 52 banned ingredients. What what are are a few of those? If if you see an exhibitor on the Paleo FX floor, that exhibitor has jumped through hoops, especially if they are a food product. Mm -hmm. And we did that, Michelle did that very early on from the first show that we had. And let me tell you, after getting beat up financially that first show to turn down so many exhibitors who were willing to stroke checks, and we were like, can't take it. No, yep, this is the thing. The I want people hard. to be able to come onto that floor and not have to, unless they have an allergy, right. not have to look at the labels. Not have to worry about taking a sample, not have to worry about their kids taking a sample unless they have a food allergy because, you know, there's still nut allergies and there's a lot of really good mm-hmm. nut um, products, um, nut-based products that are at Pale FX. So, you know, for those people, they have to worry about that or if they have issues with FODMAPs or they have issues with, um, you know, eggs or anything like that. So my that was the whole thing was I want a conference where I don't have to worry about you know, my kid going up and taking a sample and getting sick or me having to the, end up at an emergency room with them somewhere and have their stomach pumped, you know, I just, uh, that was the big deal. So yes, we have vetted them. They now, it, what happened a couple of years ago was some got, didn't really quite understand how strict we were going to be about it and brought products onto the floor that we found out that they were there. And we came to, when we found out, we were like, you have to remove these products. They cannot stay here. If you continue to have them, we're gonna have to ask you to leave. And when they realized how serious we were about it, and we were like, it doesn't even make sense for you to have those products here. Like, a lot of times, I would even turn down people that had products that weren't in line with us. And then I realized that was actually not doing all, you know, a, a full service to everybody that's there. Um, because there were a couple of companies that I, I did, I wanted to do business with companies that believed in our message and believed what we were talking about as far as health was concerned. And so if they were still having products that had gluten, say in it, or soy or whatever, or sugar in them, even though they had a line that was paleo, I was like, nope, you're just trying to take advantage of right now what's kind of a big, huge trend is paleo is trending right now. I don't want somebody that's just trying to take advantage of it. I want somebody that fundamentally believes in what we're doing. So um, we finally got to a point where we realized that there were a lot of really great products out there and the companies really believed in that, but they also were trying to cater to several different types of, of diets. And I thought, okay, if you're trying to, it was more than niche things like, you know, vegans, vegetarians, they would have a vegan line, they would have a vegetarian line, they would have a paleo line, they would have a keto line. Okay, but they all stayed in that health space where it was not the same mainstream garbage, like their even their vegan, vegetarian, and, you know, whatever lines all had 
they were all still fairly clean. And like they would even go so far as to not have soy even in the vegan line, which was, you know, that's like pulling teeth. I mean, that's the their mainstay of is protein is soy, which is terrible in our country. So well, I think that's one of the many things I like about you guys' conference is I know if I'm walking around the floor, I could just eat anything. Yeah. Right. And that's, there's not many places on, I mean, I can eat anything, you right. know, like I'm going to live, right? Sometimes I get some M&Ms. I'm like, I crush that shit. It's delicious. <laughs> Whatever. You know, it's like, yeah, yeah. I, I try not to That's be, just your DNA working against yeah, I try you. Not to that's be, all it is. <laughs> I'm aware of orthorexia and I've been really extreme right, right. with different diets and stuff. Yeah. That said, you, you know, when I go into Whole Foods, I mean, and I don't put anything in my cart unless I'm familiar with it and it's already been mm-hmm. vetted to my standards or I'm going to read the ingredients. And if it has canola oil, safflower, right. any of that shit, I'm like, nope, put it back. It's right. just, I'm yeah. done. Um, so it's nice to be able to go somewhere and you're like, ah, oh, I'm free. Yeah. yeah. I can just run around and like gorge on all the samples <laughs> and stuff and I don't even trip. And we get that feedback quite often. Oh, it's yeah. like awesome. People really appreciate the fact that, they, and especially their kids. I can turn my kids loose here right. and they can, you know. They're... There's a, uh, a restaurant in New York that's kind of uh, deli style. It's called uh, Hugh Kitchen. Yes. yes. You guys been love, love that, that place. place. Yeah, I was yeah. walking. This they have the best chocolate. Oh, dude. Yeah. They, oh, yeah, they do. And their bars are everywhere now. Yeah, right. But I was walking down the street. I'm like, you know, New York, it's hard to eat clean, especially years ago. I used to go there for work and it was, mm-hmm. I mean, it was really hard then. But yeah, I walked by and saw their sign and it was like, no refined sugar, no canola right. oil, no this. I was like, what? <laughs> Hell yeah. Grass fed the whole thing, right. you know? Yeah. And uh, yeah, so it's, that's when I go to New York, it's one of the only places I just know I can walk in and eat and anything in there is going to be clean, okay, yep. you know? And, and that type of, that type of experience really makes our day yeah. because we know we're having an effect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right? man. Just the fact that a, that a entity like that can exist in New York that advertises the fact that they are clean, grass-fed, you know, all of these things. I mean, that's a win for us. Mm -hmm. Huge win. Mm -hmm. I want to go into, you know, I've done a lot of shows where we talk about the differences with, you know, the vegan diet and Mm plant-based diet Mm -hmm. and and all this. And I've pissed off quite a few (laughs) plant-based people because I have personal experience. I'm not, you Mm -hmm. know proselytizing from a place of not having had the experience i did my i was never vegan but i was vegetarian for around 10 years and my health was just really and i was in bad bad shape mostly as a result of the food i was eating so any vegans listening you know this is not like us against them thing i think it's Mm -hmm. dumb to like base your personal identity on the type of fuel you put in your body because you're not even your fucking body anyway (laughs) let alone the fuel you put in it so let's just like put that out there right Right. like i am not a meter i'm not a paleo i'm not you know anything uh but i i do think that it's important to have these discussions in an Mm -hmm. open-minded and conscious way especially right now as it's related to environmentalism. Mm -hmm. Anything that's got an ism on it, I'm already skeptical of because there's going to be a skewed, dogmatic, oftentimes not based in reality point of view. And, you know, this idea that farting cows is going to end the planet in 12 years and Florida is going to be fucking underwater. Like, I'm just not buying it. I'm sorry. There were millions of bison on not well, I was going to say this nation. I don't know what they had here. Wildebeest maybe before that. But, you know, we had 40 million bison or whatever it was across the plains of the United States. We had amazing soil. The air was fine. Those bison were farting presumably as much mm, as yeah. even the worst factory farm mm-hmm. cattle would now. Right. So there's just so many holes in the logic of that. And, you know, you have people now going up to fight for environmentalism um, and they're you know, their ships get stuck on the North Pole because of too much ice. You know, yeah. so there's just, there's things going on that just right. kind of defeat the narrative there. I don't want to get political with it, yeah. but I will talk about my own observation of, uh, you know, living some of the time as a kid in Colorado and going by these factory farms right. and the smell and just, you look out in a field, it's dry, there's no grass, the right. animals are being tortured. And it's just, you just know, looking at that, that shit's not right. Right, it's right. horrible. Yeah, Absolutely. and then... Also, um, because I'm somewhat conscious of these things uh, and decided to not be a vegetarian after all those years and started eating meat, I still uh, wrestled spiritually with the idea mm-hmm. of taking a life. And the fact that, you know, we were talking about this at dinner the other night a little bit. Right. Um, Keith is, I, I'm kind of a wuss. Like, I don't want to go slit the throat of a pig that's hung up by its hind legs, or I don't want to go blow a hole in an elk's head and eat it like i want someone else to do the dirty work 
I don't want to go work at a slaughterhouse mm. for even the best raised grass fed cattle, but I want to eat it because my body wants it. Like that's mm-hmm. the reason that I eat animal products is if I don't, I feel like shit. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like, it's a me or them thing. Mm-hmm. So I say all that to say, we can agree with everyone that is concerned about the environment that's plant-based that has a sense of ecology and kindness towards sentient beings. Mm-hmm. And I also have been to farms that are doing regenerative farming mm-hmm. and raising livestock and they're taking deserts and turning them into exactly. lush grasslands, right. mimicking the rotation of animals in nature. And you guys mentioned a farm, I think in Texas somewhere that's, Ranch. that's mm-hmm. doing Ranch. this. So, you both give me a little download and perhaps people that, you know, have more of the environmental concerns of like what holistic farming or regenerative farming looks like in terms of environmental impact versus the demonized and rightly so factory farm model. Well, the, the thing is, is that we've been to, so Joel Salatin, um, founder of Polyface Farms as a regenerative farm as, and teaches it to anyone that wants to come learn and same thing goes for Taylor Collins and Katie Forrest, who are the owners of Epic Bars and now Rome Ranch. Um, they, everything that they do is in, um, in the vein of making sure that everything is regenerative, that they are doing everything that they can to put back to the ecosystem what we've removed and what we've taken away. And so they, it's really interesting to go out to their ranch and... Um, just watch. Uh, so they have a very large bison herd and we were able to go out there for a bison harvest and it was done so humanely and with such reverence towards the animal and with such, um, gratitude for the animal giving up its life. And what was interesting was, um, and I actually made it there right after they shot the, um, the bison, but the bison was put down while it was grazing. It was not put through some kind of torturous thing where it was being fattened up with a whole bunch of other cattle and then it was being shoved into this chute to go down this maze and then, you know, and they're terrified when this is happening to them and they know this and yet this is still allowed to happen. And, you know, my thought process around all of that, and you probably have the same thought process is you're consuming that. You're consuming that fear. You're consuming whatever's happened to that animal. You're consuming all of that. So the last thing that I want to do is take part in consuming an animal that actually was killed in a way that was not in reverence or in gratitude to its life and with uh, just a modicum of decency and for, you know, and and respect. And so that was what was beautiful about that. And the the herd that was around him didn't even blink an eye, nothing. There was no fear. There was no, you know, running. There was no How nothing. far away was the shooter? It was like 50 yards. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they, so Did they have it a was, silencer or something? Like, nope. No, it no. was, I mean, they just, just one trying shot. to look <laughs> around. Yeah. yeah. So it, what it was, was uh, there was a, they had a number of bulls, I think three or four. And if you know animal husbandry, you, you, too many bulls are going to start causing problems because they're, hierarchical animals are going to fight for dominance and they had one bull young bull that was getting kind of uppity (laughs) and so you're the first one to become bison jerky kid (laughs) you better cool it um so it was it was done very naturally they just uh kind of walk out in the herd and separate the uh you know try to get this single bull separated out from the herd they got it down to about three so the mate the main herd is 25 yards off the other couple are you know just kind of hanging and they're just grazing i don't know what's going on and the the shooter who happened to be the cfo for uh for epic um it it just set up limed up he was in the back of a truck and he just waited till the animal turned just so he could get a perfectly clean shot and it was one shot animal dropped never knew i'd hit him um and uh they field dressed there that we got to take part in and got to oh, see, wow. which was mm-hmm. so impressive. I think he weighed out at uh, 800 pounds or something. It yeah. was huge. Damn. Um, it was it was a sight to see him coming in and them bringing him in. And uh, But it was, like I said, it was just a very reverent right. moment of, of being conscious and grateful for the fact that this animal gave his life. And then 
kind of a total different just juxtaposition, which was really interesting for us as we spent the day, we went through that part, we were dressing the animal, we were doing the slaughter and, and all of that. But they took us out um, when they did paddock change, when they were taking the herd from one paddock field to the next. And it was like a party. The I have never seen bison hop and jump like that. It was Oh really? Right. Oh my god, it was just like it just really fills my heart when I just think about the fact that these animals get the opportunity to live the life they're meant to live. They're, they're they getting get to new live grass. their potential, I mean, yes. They're getting fresh new grass and so they're so. stoked. But they were and just they're, oh they're my gosh, they were so they're stoked. Aware. They're, they're, aware. they're totally aware of this. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. when they pull into the thing with the with the the trucks that bring them around, um, they st- we start dropping these little bricks of food for them because they'll follow it and they know. And then they're all ho- hopping and jumping and they're all excited and they're all running around and they're playing and they're kind of it's almost like the high fiving. I mean, like they're it's it's a it's an it is just a really beautiful sight to watch them when they they do this and they said this is like the best part of our day it's the most fun thing we get to do and i'm like no doubt man and it was just so cool and they what they do is they go find their biggest animal the biggest one because everybody's going to follow that one and they get him coming along first and then the whole herd looks up and is like oh it's time to go we're gonna go get new food yay and then the, it is it was just like i said it was just a beautiful sight to see because you see animals that are actually living in the in the the natural setting that they were meant to live in, that they were meant to thrive in, that they were meant to be happy in. And the fact that we take that all away from them when we put in confined animal feeding operations and that they live this miserable existence, they're sick, none of them are healthy. I mean, it's just really sad to think that we as humans do that to animals that we are in turn going to consume because we're consuming all of that to know that you get to consume an animal that had a very happy life and that it, it fulfilled its entire, you know, purpose in being here and that it was, it reached all of its potential and it was really a beautiful thing to watch and just watch them all running and, and, and it was, it was just really cool. Just and the really fact great. that just that practice in and of itself is regenerating the earth. Um, it, so Epic Katie and uh, Taylor at Epic, Ep- Epic sold recently to General Mills, I believe it was. Mm-hmm. Um, Cha-ching. <laughs> yes, but it, and they took a lot of flack for that within the paleo community. Oh, they, oh, did. they sold out. You know the, the whole. It's going to change right. Epic. It's whatever. But what they did was number one, they they maintained quality control of the product, and the other thing that they did was they took a large portion of the proceeds of that sale. And put their money where their mouth was. They then took the proceeds of that sale and then went and bought this ranch that was essentially a fallow ranch, because I mean it's they, just barren, like it was barren. Yeah, yeah. Because the, they had pictures of it, and we it were out in one paddock that they haven't, they haven't brought the animals um, on for a while. So they do it in a very, very succinct manner in the way that they re, um, the reforestation of the land. It is just the most incredible thing. And they know exactly what they're doing. They know exactly how they're doing it. And they're teaching other people how to do this and how to turn this barren land into lush grasslands that they can actually breed animals on. They can farm on if they want to. The But it gets back to we don't monocrop. We don't do all right. of those things. It's the crop rotation and doing all of that correctly. And they have been, it's just been an amazing thing to watch what they've done. And this was a farm that was, that was following the old practice that takes place in Texas. It takes place across the U.S. of this rotation of cotton, corn, and soy. Right. Cotton, corn, soy. Cotton, corn, soy. Tilling, 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 fertilizing, and it just devastates the land. You do that for 60 years and you get land like at this ranch that they bought that can't support anything. And when I mean anything, like weeds have a there tough time even, growing. Right, yeah, right. there wasn't even bugs. Fallow. There yeah, wasn't even bugs. Completely and, you barren. Know, obviously, we, you know, the whole pesticide thing, that's a whole nother. Mm. Right. And, but you, the problem is, is that the bugs play a part in all of this. 
they play a role and that yeah do we want them actually getting into the food no we really don't but there's ways of being able to create land that actually self-sustains and actually gets rid of the bugs that don't that aren't good for the foods and keeps the ones that are great for building the bacteria, building the soil and putting nutrients back into the foods. And it's, it's just amazing to watch what they've done. But it was one of the things I wanted to kind of go back to is that they took a lot of flack for take um, mm-hmm. getting bought out by general mills. And everybody kept saying, Oh, general mills is going to change Epic bars and Epic went, Nope we're going to change General Mills, and they have. And General wow. Mills has created this entire program mostly because of of Taylor and Katie to actually support the um, reforestation of lands. And it, they had uh, big executives out there when we were out there that we met um, that were part of this and that were really understanding and starting to realize how much um, what's happened in the past and what they were part of destroyed our our lands and our ability to really provide us good nutrient dense foods. And so it was really incredible. Right. We're super um, happy to be involved with um, uh, Taylor and Katie and, you know, Taylor and Katie launched Epic Bars at our 2013 event and sold by the 2015 event to, right. to, Damn. Um, so yeah, that's, that's quick. But that is because they knew wow. exactly what they were doing. They knew exactly what they wanted to do. They knew, I mean, they just went in with an entire vision plan and everything and mission. And, uh, they just, uh, the, everything that they do is really, really good. They just really have, um, great processes for how they handle everything and how they, they, there's a very specific brand voice and mission and vision and, uh, they're impressive. And all of that said, you know, take your eyes off of general mills. No way. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are, (laughs) we are fond of saying your most immediate form of democracy is what you buy. Mm -hmm. Follow closely by your attention where you place your attention. Right. So if you want to change a company, or if you want to throttle a company for doing bad business, you don't buy their products. Right. And you shift what you buy to companies that, that you believe in. Well, I think, that, it, yeah, it's really... That changes things. It absolutely does. It's it's like when people bitched about, you know, Walmart carrying organic milk or whatever. I'm like, dude, what? I'm that's like, a, that's awesome. That's a win. Making sure. these Big things win. more available to the masses right. and, you know, educating people that that's even a possibility. Right. And I think that, you know, going back to the environmentalism piece with you know whether or not you're going to raise plants or animals um to me the most one of the most devastating cycles in farming is what you described you know this Mm -hmm. monocropping where you're just you're making fake soil Mm -hmm. uh like almost a pharmaceutical um life support for whatever you're trying to grow and so it's not about even whether or not you're raising animals or plants it's like the way in which you're doing it the methods you're using and i always think mimicking nature in any given situation is the best and you can just watch those like animal planet shows of the sahara and you see um, migratory animals and especially the the animals you know like you're um in in the u.s you know the bison for example going back where the animals eat the grass they take a poop the right. bugs come to eat the poop or the bacteria in the poop and then the birds come and follow that and right. then the next thing on the food chain and the next thing and the next thing and the next thing you know everyone's gone in a big circle and the grass comes back again you know mm-hmm. and this is not going to happen if you're growing monocrops of kale no. as wonderful mm-hmm. as many people think kale in which i would argue that it's and if not. we're worried about carbon emissions what is the biggest carbon sink there is it's grass and soil mm-hmm. and what supports grass and soil it's the process you just described, mm-hmm. right. which is led by hooved animals mm-hmm. roaming the land. That's right. what that's what kicks off the whole process. Right. So another piece of this is, <laughs> you know, I'm going back to the days of like the, making the decision to break out of vegetarianism just for pure my own survival and having to reconcile spiritually mm. um the taking of a life and we were talking about this again also the other night keith is you know growing up with my mom in california and not ever being exposed to any animals being raised or slaughtered or anything like that like i would have been even probably a few hundred years ago it would have been really common that everyone was living in a rural area you raised animals you ate them there were no vegetarians or vegans to speak of really on any large scale Maybe, you know, in India and different places, but they weren't healthy. <laughs> but <laughs> it's another conversation. Right. But anyway, 
So I'd go out to my dad's and he'd take me hunting and I was horrified by the blood and the guts and, you know, field dressing a bear. And right, these, I mean, right. it was just like horrible. And I, I now looking back, I really don't think it's because it's inherently wrong or evil to take an animal's life with some reverence. Not that all hunters operate that way. Right. I think most do. I think most hunters mm -hmm. care about the land more than most people that are against hunting, to right. be honest. I'm knowing a lot of hunters in my life, but I really think it's, you know, my only exposure to seeing what's on the inside of a living being is from horror movies. I mean, honestly, this is my thing. I want to see what you think. So as a kid, the only like blood or organs or anything I ever saw was in Friday the 13th. Yeah. My dad takes me hunting. A bear falls out of a tree because his hound dogs chased it up there. And they just like, oh, get the bear. They start cutting it open. And I'm like, ah, blood, right, guts, right, right. intestines. Yeah, it's like, right. whoa. Had I been, you know, as an infant, mom's holding me, members of the tribe holding me, chickens are getting their head cut off all the time in our mm -hmm. little settlement or whatever. It's just, it would be normal. Mm -hmm. And I, I wouldn't have had that horror movie thing. That combined, and I have to credit my friend Daniel for this piece, but growing up on cartoons where animals were made into people. Yes. And they were our friends. Right. You combine that with horror movies and never seen, you know, an animal losing its life in a reverent, conscious way or at all then the idea of like an animal dying so that I eat it becomes the idea of murder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When in fact it's inherently just within the fiber of our being evolutionarily speaking that it would have taken place, but it's our domestication and our being divorced from that, you know, kind of harsh reality that life is taking life constantly that we've become sensitive to that. Right. You know, what's it's interesting too is that we also don't, we don't understand too that when we, if we are reverent in the way that we take uh, an animal's life is that we out in nature, they are vicious and violent with right, each other. Right, totally. I mean, animals take each other's lives and they are not reverent. They are not, I mean, it is not, if you've ever seen on, you know, animal planet or whatever, you've seen a tiger take down a gazelle it is not pretty it's and it is brutal. not, it mm -hmm. is brutal and it is, it could be really horrifying to watch something like that's all just unfortunately the circle of life that you have to accept the fact that there's nothing wrong with the, the fact that the tiger did this. It's us that makes it wrong or makes things wrong because of all of the imposed things from society and everything telling telling us that these things are wrong it's it, it's not it's just this is all natural circle of life and that sounds so super cliche but it's really truly how the whole thing was set up to work is we all at some point become food for another being and that and we just happen to be the ones with the biggest brains so that we're able to make spears and then guns. Right. Well, it's funny you mention that because I've looked at that too. And when I watch those animal shows, I feel so bad for the gazelle when the pack of hyenas, yes. you know, is chasing. I'm like, come on, go, go, go. They got them. And I'm really sad. But then if you look at it, what about the fucking hyenas? <laughs> They're hungry, man. Like, shouldn't I be sad for them that they missed the gazelle and the right. gazelle got away and now they're screwed for the next 48 hours until the next herd comes through? Yes. And I, so, you know, you know in it's, a spiritual sense, it's, it's the great mystery of life in this realm is that that violence exists coinciding with you know the most abundant love that you can feel mm -hmm. too and that they're both in this realm and they're both natural mm -hmm. and it's just it's just the way it is in this realm i can't speak to other realms but this is the one that i operate in right now um and it's you know it's just another piece of that great mosaic that is this realm thing I think is interesting about that, you know, having the reverence for the animal, and I think we would all kind of, you know, agree whether or not you eat animals or not, that that's an essential part of it. If you're going to do it, let's hope that's there. But going back to the, you know, the hunting scene, which is not really my scene, mm -hmm. I have a lot of respect for people that hunt ethically, which again, most do, and there's laws and things that make that more ethical, and there's a, you know, hopefully a balance that's created through those laws. Now that we've disrupted nature so much, there's organizations, the BLM, I guess, has to come in and like make sure that we, we prop it up, you know. Right. But anyway, the the demonization of hunters as these like dumbass, redneck, right. white dudes right. that 
the ism people would be against but no one says shit about like native americans taking down <laughs> animals or indigenous people or hunter gatherer people it's like oh no they're cool because they're not like yeah. a white hunter from tennessee or something yeah. you know with there's the, with the underlying uh, thought being they're not as advanced as we are in the civilized west right, right. that's always the underpinning Right, which right. is so elitist right. and racist so elitist. Yeah. Yes. in and of itself, you know. So right. it's a little bit of a, you know, I guess a politicized stance. But I'm I'm always looking at things, I guess, from like where's the hypocrisy and the bullshit and something. When something just like, eh, this doesn't seem right, I see those things from the other side. Right. And it's like if you look at all hunter-gatherer people and indigenous people, for the most part, all over the planet, they're all eating everything all the time, whatever they can right. get a hold of. But yet, most well, most people that would be anti eating animals are totally cool with them, but not with you know, this, uh, certain other people. We're doing opportunistic it. eaters. I we mean, are. that's just really when you get down to it. If you are, if you're stuck somewhere on you know some deserted place where you can't get to, you become you will eat whatever gets put in front of you and if that happens to be a rabbit or a, you know whatever it is you're going to end up ultimately eating it because you're made that way you are made to survive and to th and to ultimately make sure that you go on living and however that may be it won't you may not enjoy it whatever but that's what's going to happen if it comes down to it's going to be my life or this this you know, beings life. That's just how we are. Well, that's how every living organism is, is right? Exactly. It's called optimal foraging theory. Yeah. So every, and I mean, from virus, bacteria, all the way up to people, every organism given their abilities operates under optimal foraging theory, meaning how can I expend the least amount of energy to get the most amount of calories in? Every living organism does that. Now, humans have bastardized that because we've created this human zoo that allows us to get a maximum amount of calories, way more than what we need, mm -hmm. um, given our abilities. And so we've kind of tilted the scales quite a bit. But if you took us back to hunter and gatherer times, we operated under the same theory that a honeybee operates, that a, that a bear operates under, that every living organism operates under. We just happen to have the ability to be able to take in protein, carbohydrates, which allowed us, along with being able to communicate and form tribes, to spread across the world very, very rapidly. We just have more tools than other organisms have. Um, and now that's working against us right. because we have more tools and a consciousness. We're able to create these artificial realms around us and create Franken foods that, oh, by the way, hit every freaking trigger that we have dopamine release. Just, you know, and, and not uh, no society foods with no breaks as Melissa Hardwick likes to say, mm -hmm. um, we've just created those for ourselves. But if you realize that it's much easier to back yourself out of that zoo. Mm hmm and operate a little bit better. If you understand the rules of the game, you can better play the game. Well, you brought up the human zoo, which segues perfectly into what I want to cover with you guys next. And that is, I think, often a missing piece because it's the one that requires even more discipline than changing your diet, right? You have, mm -hmm. you know, so the paleo diet, people might be having health challenges, autoimmune, et cetera. They read about the GAPS diet or this diet, keto, blah, 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 carnivore, whatever, anything kind of in the paleo, we eat a lot of meat realm. <laughs> yet ignore EMFs, blue light, right. drinking fluoridated shitty water, uh, you know, all of the things that come with like urban dwelling, right. like live, even being, you know, the room we're in now, not to be paranoid. I have my orange glasses on. I'm fine. You guys aren't so much. <laughs> We've got overhead lighting, which doesn't exist in nature. The sun right. is hardly ever right over your head. The spectrum of light's wrong. There's flicker in the light. The air is processed air, like processed food. It's mm -hmm. coming in from outside. Mm -hmm. Probably has chemtrails still in it, depending on the filtration system in here. Uh, we're seated in chairs that would never exist in nature. There's right angles everywhere we look. That mm -hmm. would never exist in nature. So, like, right now, we are in a human zoo. Absolutely. And it's make you know, I don't want to put negativity, but... If we spend enough time in here, we're going to be just like animals that they take out of the wild and put in a zoo. Yes. Right. They get sick. The animals in the zoo get sick and need to go to animal hospital and see the vet mm -hmm. because they're in the zoo. Right. If they were left alone in the wild, they'd be thriving until, you know, dying of old age, right? Or 
predation. Yeah. So what have you guys done in your personal life or to promote through your conference some of the other elements of paleo life in general? Well, you know, the conference... Since we can't go backwards. Yeah. We can kind of sure. mimic it here and there and patch it together, but unless you want to go live in fucking Alaska in the right. middle of the woods, <laughs> you, you, right. you can't, you know, there's no going back. One of the things that we've said all the time is we're not trying to reinvent the caveman days. We're not trying to go back to the cave and spear. What we want to do is leverage technology to become better optimized humans. And so um, for us, bringing in people that talk about EMFs, that explain what this looks like, how they can avoid as much of it as possible, it's really impossible for us to avoid them completely just because of now you have municipalities that are bringing in 5G and things like this where you have no say over the fact that you, other than if you go live in Alaska, you can the, choose that. I mean, you And can, even in but, Alaska, you're going to get HARP right. and you're probably going to get military radar, which is even worse <laughs> than like... <laughs> you know, a cell right. tower. So, you know, you've got, so it's really just, just trying to be really practical about how you deal with what is it, what are the things that you can do to just minimize things in your life. But again, being obsessive about it, it's actually probably worse than what, whatever's happening to you. So our whole thing is just being really, um, just trying to be very mindful of the fact that you take precautions where you can and you don't stress over the stuff you can't control because at the end of the day, really the only thing that we control is our reaction and our response to everything. So um, we bring in talks. Um, it, it For us, PaleoFX is a three-day lifestyle immersion event. And we it's for us, it's seven pillars of health. And so you need to cover all of those for people to be fully capable um, and flourishing humans. And so we're talking physical health, mental health, emotional health, relational health, financial health, spiritual health, and the last piece. And it, I would say probably one of the most important is your tribe. It's your community because we're tribal people who need that connection and need to have community people that are like-minded who think like we do, who um, we can feel like we belong somewhere because at the end of the day, we need to belong somewhere or feel like we're part of something that's bigger than ourselves. So we bring in all of those elements. And then of course the regenerative agriculture, that part EMFs and really trying to go, trying to get ourselves into a state that is as natural as possible without being okay. We're, we don't want to get tinfoil on things. We just don't want to, you know, it's yeah. all of those things just need to be really taken in. And that um, balance is different for different balance. people. Right. You know, and it's all about what can you do without driving yourself crazy mm -hmm. and that being more so a detriment than the thing that you're trying to avoid is. Right. And, and that's different for different people. Right. Uh, but I, I know it when I see it. I know it when I see the biohacker and the quantified self person who's got just this spreadsheet upon spreadsheet of things that they're trying to manipulate, manipulate. and do. And you and you kind of just go, I think maybe that might be obsessive for you. Totally. I think maybe yeah. the cortisol <laughs> hit that you're that you're receiving by going, oh my God, I gotta I gotta take care of all these variables might be worse than the variables themselves. And so there's not a definite answer for every one person. I'm raising but, my hands, guys. But, <laughs> and, well, and I think everybody, you know, it's a it's a seesaw, it's a teeter totter. You, you know, for a while you might go eh, too far over this way, then you might go a little bit too lax. But if you can try to find a middle ground between all of these things. You know, just the water we're drinking. Can I can I get the best possible water possible? Mm -hmm. And if not, and if I'm really really thirsty and I don't have any other options, well, you know what? Tap water is going to be it for at least this drink. Yeah. Right. And then you know, just in every moment, you just try to make. It goes back to don't let the perfect answer. get in right. the way of the good. So we, that's really what we strive for at Pillow Effects and 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 bringing that to people is. Um, what are the things that you can do to keep your EMFs down? Can you turn off your, your devices? You turn off your Wi-Fi at night. Are you going to be completely EMF free? No, it's not going to happen. Don't stress over that. Just let's get it the best that we can be. Sleeping, um, you know, obviously we both sleep with a ma night mask so that we can, you know, make sure our circadian rhythm stays. Those are the things that I think, those are the things that are really controllable. And those are the things that can really move the needle on like particularly sleep or whatever. And being able to um, recognize, okay, when I'm in that moment of a little bit, because this is the thing, I'm a biohacker myself, not a lot of us female biohackers, but 
I have. Yeah, I, unfortunately, get yeah. on get on board, girls. <laughs> right. What the hell? We um, but I track just about everything in my. I mean, like I track my everything I eat. I track you know my mood. You name it, I track it. And the thing is, is that if I like, I've skipped some days here being here in London, and I'm not stressing over it. It is what it is. Well, I'll get back on track of seeing where things are at, and if I did some, you know, did something that that caused an issue with sleeping. And mostly I track my stuff for sleep. I track, what did I do today that I didn't sleep last night? You know, what did I do? Um, did I eat something? Did I, whatever. That's usually for me, I'm usually tracking everything towards sleep um, and whether or not I'm gaining weight or whether or not I'm, how am I feeling? Did I feel like crap today? Did I, did I, you know, have, was I in a brain fog? Did I have no energy, all of those things. So those are the things that I try to track for is to make sure that I go back and go, oh, okay, it was because I did this late in the afternoon, or I whatever it is, you know, and then I'm like, okay, I need to really be mindful of not doing that again. Because at the end of the day, I really love sleep. And I really want to sleep a lot. And so that's, um, that those are the things that I think you just like get really key into the things that really are specific for you that really make your life better. If it's not making your life better and it's making you more stressed, then it's probably something you don't need to be worried about. That's a great distinction. You know, when I interviewed Mark Atkinson a couple of days ago, I was asking him about that because I always ask the things that I'm that I'm working on. You know, yeah. it's like, how do we have this awareness about some of these practices and doing our best to live in alignment with nature and finding that balance, you know, mm -hmm. where we're not too neurotic. And you mentioned the cortisol. I mean, when right. I walk in, a, when I walk into a room and I see the lighting, I I get a cortisol response from the lighting, which is just biological, <laughs> right. but also emotionally because I'm like, oh fuck, right. horrible lighting. You yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> so I was asking him about it, and he had a really great take on it that was much longer than we, you know I could ever repeat or we have time for. But the essence of it was like, it's not that you have to change what you're doing it's how you're doing it so he was like yeah if you want to do all the biohacks and the tracking and stuff great but are you doing it in a state of stress right mm -hmm. i'm like yeah a lot of the time i am i walk in my hotel room i'm like okay where's my light bulbs i gotta you know i'm freaking out mm -hmm. you know or i got my emf meter i'm like all right where's the goddamn router you right. know <laughs> but i'm not you know i'm not having i'm not having fun when i'm not relaxed doing that and right. like oh this is interesting let me just play with this and you know surrender if i can't change it i'm like oh I'm kind of uptight and tense about it. So mm -hmm. it was it was a great realization for me. Like, no, I can still do me. Like, I like that shit. I like having my MF meter and like figuring it out. I'm a geek. Mm -hmm. I'm a geek. That's who I am. But if I'm doing that with fear, it's like double jeopardy. Now I'm getting the biological hit and the emotional hit from mm -hmm. like living in a state of right. tension and fear, you know? Yeah. So I think for my listeners, a lot of them are super geeks too and probably pretty paranoid based mm -hmm. on our Facebook group where everyone's freaking out about EMFs all the right. time. <laughs> if I have Jack Cruz on the show once a year, I'm going to like have a fear-based audience for a year because <laughs> he freaks the fuck out of everyone, you know, and rightfully so, but there's a way to approach it, um, right. I think, with a relaxed nervous system. I mm -hmm. think... In, in, isn't this true in everything in life, though, right? You realize what the what the danger is or the obstacle, and it's how you react to that is, mm -hmm. means everything. Should you be mindful of it? For sure you should be mindful of it. But can you actually make a change calmly right now in reaction to that? Right. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's the big key. And again, that's different for everybody. It looks different for Michelle than it looks like for me. Mm -hmm. um, but Which I think one of you is more of the biohacker and like more concerned about? I do far more tracking, right? Okay, but he does a lot more. I would say experimenting with things that I'm like, eh, I just don't. I'm not interested in that. Whatever. Right. So I would say we're kind of like a kind of pretty close because right. I do a lot more tracking than he does and a lot more quantifying what's what's going on with me than than he does. He's kind of like that part. He's just like, eh, because one thing that's and this is a big thing for us as people, as humans, and really the probably the biggest snare in the human zoo is that we are so disconnected from our bodies and he is so connected to his. I can tell. Like he knows, like he's like, oh shit, I really should not have done eight, you know, eight this, that, or the other, whatever. He'll be like immediately he knows that he just fucked up and he shouldn't have done whatever, he ate whatever or um, consumed something or one thing that he just recently started noticing was he's not doing well with alcohol 
And he's like, uh, okay, I'm just going to have to nix that. Sadly. That oh, makes two of us. <laughs> yeah. I relate. <laughs> yeah. So he's more into, this is his tracker. You know, he's got an aura ring and everything and he, and he does watch some of that stuff, but he doesn't watch it like I do. And his, his tracker is really this, his tracker tells him, yeah, dude, let's not have that, that second, you know, you know, tequila or let's not have that, whatever it was anyway. So he's far more in tune. And the problem is, is that most of us are not. And the one thing that I've really gotten myself into is that, that state of going, okay, so today, how did I actually feel? Did I, did I have some energy? Okay. And then I'm tracking that. And did I, was I in a good mood? Okay. I'm track that. And did I sleep well? Did I, was I nasty? Was I on edge? Was I the, those are the things that I track and that's me tapping into, but I have to be mindful of it. It just comes through him. So I have to really like sit down and think about it. Okay. And I, Oh, three o'clock, man, I was about to die. I just really wanted to go to sleep. Okay. Something caused that because nor that's not my norm. You know what I mean? Yeah, so totally. Really being able to, so I track things, but he didn't have to. And that's one thing I really, back when I was actually coaching people, um, using heart rate variability, I would have them track their heart rate variability, but not look at it first thing in the morning. Um, and I would have my clients wake up, take an assessment, take a moment, just sit with yourself, sit with your feelings, sit and try to get in touch with your body and rate how you feel. Let me know how you feel in this moment and how you think you're going to be able to tackle the day. And over time, to be able to relate a feeling, an internal feeling to what their heart rate variability reading was. Because heart rate variability across the board is a pretty good measure of a person's readiness. Mm-hmm. It's, it's probably the, the best thumb rule that I've found. Very, very easy. Again, takes very little tracking. Um, it's a very, bam, quick indication, quick window. But I wanted them to move away from the actual getting, the, the actual reading, to actually feeling what it was inside. Because ultimately, that's what matters. That is the number one indication. And to the extent that you can reconnect with that, you are that much more another step out of the human zoo. Because a human zoo, if it does anything, it disconnects us from our bodies and how we actually feel. Um, and, and so for, for like tracking, like Michelle has had to be fastidious about her sleep just because of the issues she's battled with before. Mm-hmm. And so she tracks her sleep and it, and it's all about her sleep where I'm like, you know what? Fuck it. You turn off the lights. I have five minutes. I'm asleep. I have zero problems sleeping. Um, but she does. And she's really had to track that on the flip side of things. If you were to ask me how much tracking do I do with my workouts and such? Yeah, that's where I geek out. And I am really, really fine-tuned, and I'll, you know, tweak one rep here, one rep there, a range of motion tweak, and all of those. So that's kind of where I geek out. Um, and oh, she's yeah, just like, true. yeah, whatever. <laughs> I am totally like. <laughs> on that side. So it just kind of like, depends. Okay, on, I did, I did um, you know, deadlifts and like, whatever you want to call them. like, I went into the gym, all right, get I, off my ass. <laughs> <laughs> I showed up. <laughs> I showed up. That's kind of 90% of the battle. That's kind of where I am too. And that's why your biceps are four times as big as mine. I want to cover something with you guys in the last Many few minutes people's. here. Not just yeah, no, I know. Hum- Humboy's ripped. He's doing, he's doing paleo workouts, obviously, and lifting giant boulders every morning or something. Um, but I want to cover something that really like one of the main things I want to talk to you guys about, but I always just have to surrender my little paperwork, you know, right, my manuscript right. and it just goes where it goes. And I think we've done an amazing job of really diving into some cool shit, but you guys are huge plant medicine people. And I'm sitting here thinking Indeed. about, okay, we're in this human zoo. So we've, we've divorced ourselves from our natural environment. We're eating these unnatural foods. We're going to go back to the paleolithic approach to eating. Let's as ner- less neurotically as possible, look at lighting, EMFs, the water, our environment, our sleep, right? What about the idea of paleo psychotherapy, Mm -hmm. which maybe you could call um, shamanism Mm -hmm. and plant medicine ceremonies? Mm -hmm. Uh, Evolutionarily speaking, that, you know, the elders were our shrinks, right? right? And we're fucked up psychologically. We have trauma, which even right. paleo people had their own version of trauma, you know? Mm-hmm. Your mom was killed by a bear in front of you or, you know, you were molested by some weirdo or yeah, whatever, right, right, you know? Right. Shit still happened. Um, 
but there was a different sort of framework by which we could work on ourselves psychologically. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's like a bad time to bring this huge topic up toward the end. <laughs> We've got like 10, maybe 15 minutes left, but no worries. you know, how did you guys get into the plant medicine scene and, and what's your perspective on kind of the evolutionary piece of that? Mm -hmm. Well, for for us, what's interesting is we brought it into Paleo FX because we thought it was an important um, topic for us to start covering because we believe that as humans, we really evolved because of plant medicines. That we were, when you think about and you look at some of the things that have been created and um, and uh, invented. You just, when you, once you go into a plant medicine ceremony and you see what that realm looks like, n then you start recognizing, oh shit, now I know how that was created. Like I know where that came from because the, the, um, heightened state of awareness that you get into in your consciousness and being able to really tap in directly to the divine, in my opinion, um, is a, a place of, I mean, it's unprecedented creativity and ability to see things that are not there that could be. Um, and so um, I can honestly tell you the reason I ever started a plant medicine was simply I wanted to see our daughter who had passed away. That was it. That was the whole reason I went. And I ended up obviously with so much more because we've done a lot of plant medicines. I've done 69 ceremonies in ayahuasca. Keith has done 65. Um, and then we've also done a lot of Wachuma ceremonies now. And so um, we've done combo, you name it. We've we've tried a lot of different things. Getting ready to do an MDMA therapy here soon. With each other? Um, yes. We're oh, gonna do, well, we're, I'm going to do one by myself and then, um, we're going to, and then we're going to do an MDMA like with a therapy. clinical practitioner or yes. with a I'm, shaman. I'm going to do an MDMA therapy with a clinical oh, practitioner cool. and then out in Texas. Yes. Oh, cool. And, um, they will, re they will remain unnamed. Yes, right. they will remain unnamed. <laughs> and so I, I'm assuming the laws there aren't that friendly with that. Yeah. Okay. I, you know what, Texas with now with the FDA, general, it is a little yeah. bit, but now that the FDA has approved the MDMA therapy for right. um, PTSD and that type of thing, I think you're, we're going to start seeing some things come across the board a little bit when, when you start seeing things, we're going to start seeing things change there. I think um, it's going to take a while for Texas. We are a little backward, but at the end of the day though, my whole thought process was I ended up with so much out of. Um, the plant medicine ceremonies, stuff I didn't know I needed. And I honestly, and he, would, we were very open about this. I honestly believe that if we had not started plant ceremonies, Keith and I would not be married anymore. Like, I think he would have divorced me a long time ago. And I'm totally open about that because I was a, such a completely different person back then. Everything was, I was stressed out about everything. I was a bitch about everything. I did not, I, my I was in a constant state of fight or flight. I was just, everything was just, I so focused on exactly the shit that I didn't want. So what's going to happen when you focus on something, you're going to get what you're focusing on. The shit I didn't want. And it just was a consistent thing that just kept coming. I was constantly looking for what I didn't want and realized very quickly through plant medicine that focus on what you want. When you start focusing on what you want, you're going to start getting what you want. And so those were the, some of the things that came up for me then. You know, I know one of the, probably one of the most um, profound um, things that came through for me was, of course, the first thing that was, you have this belief that you have control. I mean, you hear about people that are control freaks and that they have to have control and whatever. And it's such an illusion like we have no control. We have we have no control. And just the idea as humans that we think we have that kind of power is hilarious <laughs> to me because this is this is the only thing that you get to control is this and right. how this if it reacts or if it responds to something. And in my opinion, reaction is very knee jerk and usually not pretty. It's usually something we we regret. It's usually something that we're like, Oh, that's uh, that. I can't believe I said that, or I can't believe I did that, whatever. And response is mindful and it's intentional and it takes time. It's patient. It's not 
this is, I have to get this out now and, you know, everybody's going to hear how I feel and whatever. And that's how I, I reacted to everything. I didn't respond to anything. And, um, and my life was evidence. And I was a complete example of that because I was constantly angry and constantly irritated and agitated by people and the people that loved me and that I loved. And so it, that changed profoundly for me. And then there was this, the, probably the biggest moment for me was recognizing I didn't want control. What I wanted was... Nor could you ever have it. Nor nor could you ever have it. But it's like that, again, it's that illusion of that you are controlling things because I'm I'm the CEO and co-founder of PaleoFX. Therefore, I control PaleoFX bullshit. <laughs> PaleoFX is its own thing. <laughs> like, I, you know, could, you know, make things go a certain way, but I never really ever had control. And what I realized was that I didn't want control. I wanted influence. And there's a big difference between those because if you are living in a way that's in alignment with who you really are and in what you really want and that you um, you are expressing to the world the inner part of who you are and that's a, a place of grace and love and kindness and, and everything. And I'm not by any means perfect at this at all. Obviously, this is a constant work in progress. But when you start showing that, to other people, they respect you, they trust you, they want to follow what you're telling them you want, you want done here. And when you can lay out a vision for what you want, particularly Paleo Effects, and you do it in a way that allows people to be who they are in Paleo Effects and to have autonomy and to be able to um, bring to the table their gifts and their passions and their talents and everything, and you don't squash that, which I did, I did that a lot, um, was, is allowing it to grow and to flourish and allowing me to grow and to flourish. And again, allowing people to choose for me to influence the way they're doing things. And that was super profound in plant medicine. So I ended up with so much more than just, you know, being able to see Brittany in ceremony was, getting this opportunity to recognize that I, um, I could have the things that I want in my life if I focused on those and I stopped focusing on all the shit that I didn't want. And the problem is, is that we're constantly in that state of, I, and then we do this with like our kids too, is, um, don't do that. Don't do this. Don't, right, I, right. don't you know, fall off the thing. Yeah. Don't be <laughs> late. Don't right. whatever. It's always the thing we don't want them to do instead of saying you need to be on time. You, you know, I would like for you to do this. I, you know, as opposed to whatever it is you're telling them they can't do. And so the problem is, is that's just how we've, we've all learned to, to be in this world is to constantly and consistently tell others what we don't want from them instead of what we do want from them. And so that's been for me the most profound change. And I think ultimately it ended up making me more lovable. Right. It did. <laughs> I think I mean, you guys have been together for eons, so it must right. have done something right, especially being in business together, man. That's like, tough. and that's a that's whole other, tough. there's a whole other a podcast. We, yeah. I'm not even going to dive into right. that, but I, I am aware of that because I had a business with um, a girlfriend of mine for a number of years. And you know, there were other factors, but it was, we didn't have the skills necessary to handle both. And mm. it ultimately was part of a wedge in the relationship. Right. So it's well, a conversation we'll have at a later time. Right. Yeah, for sure. At least not being a bitch because you had some self awareness from ayahuasca. <laughs> sounds like a good start. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just, it, it immediately made me really recognize, it, it makes you recognize the potential, the human potential that you have of who you can be right. if you work on who that person is instead of you know, consistently going through the slog of the day and just, you know, we, we get on autopilot and, and, um, we're not intentional. We're not mindful. We don't, we don't allow ourselves to also just be in, in things. And so, and the other piece too, and I kind of was, that's where I originally wanted to start with this was, you know, we don't, we had mechanisms way back. I mean, we have them 
innately in our bodies, but we don't use them. In fact, we shut them down to release trauma from our bodies. And the right. problem is mm -hmm. we now do that with our kids. So it's like our child's crying and the first thing we, oh, stop crying. You're going to be okay, blah, blah, blah. Just let them feel it. Let them go through that emotion. Let them get it out because that's part of the mechanism of getting rid of the trauma because ultimately we, we all know this is that trauma ultimately becomes disease in the body because it's trapped and it doesn't have any way to get out. And so we know we have uh, really great facilitators in, um, that – that have taught us TRE, which is trauma release exercise. And Keith just recently was able to train with David Purcelli, who is the creator of it. But it's that's part of the issue is that we hold on to those traumas. And sometimes people allow the trauma to become their identity. And that's something that I'm right. like, growing Ooh. into the victimhood yeah. model of like right. who I am is a victim of past experience. Totally, right. totally identifying with that. The right. victim mentality um, right and, and to the extent that you can break free of that you you're you're free mm -hmm. um, right but that that takes work as does forgiveness you know both of those things being able to truly forgive those who have trespassed against you truly forgive them um that and not identifying with that victim mentality that's mm -hmm. and it's tough and i think these plant medicines help facilitate that and make it much easier to do it's still not easy it's easier Mm -hmm. if you do the work. Um, but I think those are the two of the biggest benefits is realizing that and for me, it was just, you know, I, as a kid, I never wanted to be an astronaut, but there was something about the goings on of the, the psyche that I was super interested in. Of course I went the wrong way, you know, for being a child of the eighties. If, if it was manufactured, I took it in an excess. And so <laughs> I, I, and I, I went about it the wrong way. And I yeah. think, you know, just very, very quickly running across Terrence McKenna's book back in the early nineties, it was uh, food of the gods, which I would recommend to anybody if you're you, you, in true consciousness exploration and, and what he thought it was that spurred the growth of our creativity which is essentially stumbling upon psilocybin, which was what his theory was. And that's what spurred this just 50,000 years ago. You know, up until that point, we kind of muddled the wrong. And, you know, it took us 100,000 years to, to make a variation on a spear tip. And then 50,000 years ago, all of a sudden, something happened that just, you know, very, very quickly, we put a man on the moon, which is, you know, in evolutionary terms, it's like, what the hell happened? It, it, it just hockey stick and creativity. Well, his theory was we stumbled upon psilocybin and other plant medicines. Um, I remember seeing Dennis at your event. Right. And, uh, freaking yes. great. Yeah, I was so, I, was, I wanted to interview him so bad and it was like people were around him. I didn't want to interrupt. And then afterward, I was like, God damn it. Why are you such a wuss? Like, right. just go oh. out and be like, yo, be on my podcast. You know? He's such a cool guy. <laughs> he too. is. Yeah, he's but his, so cool. <laughs> his presentation on ayahuasca and the history right. and, you know, where it exists in the planet, you know, just the whole, his knowledge base on it was insane. It was actually one of the things that motivated me to finally like, oh, you know what? Maybe there is something there because right. I didn't really think psychedelics in general were my path because of my history, which sure, was much yeah. like right. yours. It's right. like, what? That's why would I do that? You know, right. I've got to like do it the hard way, just like <laughs> little by little. Right. I don't right. want to take a shortcut, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> right. And uh, thank God. I, I did. don't know if I would ever say an eight hour ayahuasca <laughs> journey is a shortcut. No. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but after it's, it's I a, yeah. did it, I <laughs> yeah. realized like, oh yeah. And it wasn't, you know, I didn't have a terribly hard time. Mine was a lot like yours. I would, the first three nights I was laughing my ass off just yeah. at like how stupid it is to think you're controlling anything. Right. right. And then there was, you know, also moments of healing and releasing mm -hmm. trauma and you know, all of that. But anyway, we've already, I've already done six freaking hours of podcast about it. But what was that thing you mentioned? TRE, trauma release? Trauma right. release exercise. Is that part of a psychedelic experience or is that in and of itself just a stone cold sober it, practice? You can do it either way. Um, oh, it's okay. really great for uh, preparing your body for um, down regulation of your central nervous system for Wachima, right. which oh, is San wow. Pedro. Yeah. No, I did some of that yesterday um, <laughs> before an interview. San, Pe San Pedro or TRE? No, or San both. Pedro. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think it was a microdose and some yeah. chocolates, right, right. you know, yeah. but... 
dude, I was kind of foggy when I did the interview with Dave, and then I, I wasn't like super on point, which is unfortunate because it was an important interview. But the next one I did was after I had the San Pedro chocolate. Oh yeah, that stuff. And will I was you right in, dude. I was so crystal clear and like heart connected. We were laughing. We yeah, had such nice. a great time. Yeah, I was like, it's hmm, beautiful. I want to, I want to explore some more of that. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. We have amazing facilitators. Really? So, yes. All right, I'm coming to Austin. Yeah, you need to. We, uh, they're incredible. They're the best. So it's 535, you guys, and I promised you a hard out at 530, and I think it was pretty firm. It was pretty hard. Wow, this is a weird way to end a podcast. <laughs> 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 um, but uh, lastly, because we'll, we'll, we'll have to do another deep dive into yeah, the whole plant medicine sure, thing, because right. you guys told me some stories the other night that were freaking nuts. And um, <laughs> after 60-plus ceremonies, I'm sure there's a lot You've more. you seen that just about from. everything there is to see after 60-plus yeah. ceremonies. Yeah, I, I <laughs> imagine so. <laughs> uh, but in closing, just briefly, I'd like from each of you, if you could recommend three teachers or teachings that have influenced your life that our listeners might be able to go explore. Wow. I, I, for me, I brought up uh, Terrence McKenna and Dennis McKenna, too. It's just that Terrence happens to have the voice and the charisma of the, of the two, Dennis being more academic. But early on, he was such a powerful influence in, in the psychedelic area right and this was at a time where psychedelics were you know obviously painted as a party drug and you know escapist route and all of these things and dennis was or, or terrence rather was saying no this is is you have to be a hero to dive into your own consciousness because you don't know what you're going to dig up and there is some scary chambers in there and indeed there are um and so he is really the one that made me look at plant medicines and psychedelics from a serious and really a more spiritual point of view. Um, Buckminster Fuller for me was a huge influence. I've read so much of his stuff and just, uh, just mind blowing in uh, his breadth of knowledge. Um, God, there's just so many people that I would, uh, oh, man, and on the strength and conditioning side, I'll, f I'll flip way back and go go totally bro. But um, you know the whole West Cut, the whole West Side community, Louis Simmons, and that on the strength and conditioning um, bro side of things. <laughs> I, I, I mean, <laughs> su such an undersung genius in that realm, and I just can't believe that the more traditional strength and conditioning people being in the NFL and in, in, in college football or all college athletics, all Olympic athletics, I can't believe that they haven't tapped into that knowledge base. It's just unreal. I've never heard of it. Oh, my God. If there's any way you can get Louis Simmons on your podcast. Oh, he's around still. Oh, he's still oh, yeah. around. Really? Okay. Oh, and yeah, he works absolutely. out. Absolutely. Oh, my oh, goodness. He's, Okay. Well, he is a character. Just kind of Google around and check him out. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Uh, All right. Good to know. Uh, so for me, um, Surrender Experiment by Michael Singer. Oh, my God. Yeah. Right. Best. One of the best things oh, yeah. I've read and done and, and really just kind of taken it in and sat with it and been like, okay, wow. Um, I, just, I just remember thinking, oh, yeah, how could somebody sit and meditate for like six or my feet would hurt. I just started, started doing that mental like inventory, like, oh, my gosh, you know, wow. Um, so that's a big one for me. Um, another big one, and actually really for both of us, is um, human design. It's mm. been really critical in our relationship it's been critical in me understanding who i am as a human and how i so operate so powerful such a powerful um it has been crucial to our business it's how we hire people really yeah um, damn are you serious do you guys yeah. do the disc test or myers briggs or any of those other design we is so ask them far to beyond that it is so far beyond it yeah Whoa. but yeah. we will have people tell us they're myers briggs do you know yeah. whatever but honestly it comes down to what's their design because um, I I operate a certain way and it's just how I am. And there are some things that are, um, it's interesting. Keith and I actually went through human design marriage counseling with the, the woman that we that we consult with her all the time on human design. And she's just incredible. She's would she amazing. Would be a good one to interview about? Oh, oh my God. She, yeah. Oh, you would love her. Oh, you would so love her. With her would yeah, I would, well, I definitely will. I've, I've wanted to cover, it's not something I know a lot about. I've done it and, yeah. you know, like friends and people around me are subscribe to it but i'm i'm always looking for like the person oh, oh she's yeah. it like, who's bad she actually trained directly with raw who was the person that downloaded Done. um yeah. the um 
uh, human design. And then he actually had a counterpart, Richard Rudd, who ended up ultimately breaking away and creating Gene Keys, more so on the human design side than I am on Gene Keys, but my Gene Keys are definitely dead on. Mm -hmm. And it's really, so she trained with both of them. She's worked with Eckhart Tolle. She's just, she's an amazing woman. She's got... And she can combine astrology and everything with it. She's super woo and she's super, but she's also super practical. So right. she's and just common sense. Barbara she's Ditlow. And Barbara uh, Ditlow. we love you, okay. Barbara. Anyway, she actually is going to be sitting in on my hiring process this week right now. Wow. Um, Where's she so based? Austin. Oh, wow. Cool. And all the cool people are in Austin. Right. right? I, I know. <laughs> that out yet. Anyway, so she's, um, so working with her, we actually sat down and our very first marriage counseling session with her she did most of the talking and it was and she was just telling and she she was spot on and she was spot on and what was interesting is she did a reading for keith for himself me privately then she did one as a couple this was before we ended up needing marriage counseling and then later on we started realizing oh we need to bring her into the into the, the business and all of that stuff and when we sat down and started talking to her about you know, our marriage counseling, she was just like, okay, this is how she is on this and it's not negotiable. And here's all the stuff where you can negotiate. And then this is how he is and this is non-negotiable and this is where you can. And she just really went through and explained how things work and that we took a lot of things personal that had nothing to do with the other person. It was just how we are, how are we're, how we're wired and how we work. And so I always describe human design as your underlying operating system. It's just how you are. It's who you are. The problem is, is that most of us don't operate in alignment with our human design. We'll recognize it when we hear it. We're like, oh shit, that's actually really, but I try to fight that. And when you try to fight that, you end up ultimately just hitting a brick wall over and over and over and over again. And you end up not being, having the success that you desire or that you want. And she's just made things tremendous in that area for us because it changed everything when we started using her to hire, when we started really working on our relationships in this realm. We know what our kids' designs are. We know, I mean, we have a brand new grandbaby that we haven't met yet, but we know his design. Oh, and cool. And we know how what that's going to look like as he grows up and, and want to help him nurture that, that he he really taps into. The problem is, is we're always told you need to work on your weaknesses. You need to just let those go and work on what you're really strong at and really become the best at that type of thing. And that's that's one of those things. So human design, big deal for me and for Keith. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then the other thing is, is just totally on a completely self-development side is probably one of the people that's had the most impact on us personally because we had an op- we had an opportunity to sit with him um uh personally was uh, is Darren Hardy who was the um editor of Success Magazine and so we sat down with him a few years ago and uh we are part of a company called ID Life our part of the company is ID Life Wellness and so when we had this opportunity to sit down and talk to him he was like asking us about our business, meaning Paleo effects, and is it, you know, how is it? Is it successful? And we were like, well, it's fundamentally successful, but it, you know, financially, we don't care as long as it, you know, as long as we break even. And he was like, okay. And he kind of looks at us and he's like, business that just breaks even. And he's like, what's the point of that? I, what's your point of it? And I'm like, well, our whole thing is we just want to reach more people. We, we just want to change more people. the world. We just want more break people. Even company. <laughs> yeah. We want to make, you know, we want this information out to people. And as long as it breaks even, we're okay. And he goes, can I say something to you? And you just like, kind of hear me and just be open to it. And I'm like, sure. And he's like, you know, it's great that you are mission motivated. You're not money motivated. He said, but I just want you to be open to it. If you make more money, you can touch more people. (laughs) And we were like, Oh shit. Okay. And the light bulb at that moment went off and we were like, we went back and changed all of our businesses and realized that we were, we're actually a service to humanity. And there is, we had a nick factor around making money and we realized that there was really no better way to make money than to help people become healthier and to, you know, gain sovereignty over their own life and, um, and not be dependent on any government or entity or anything like that. And so anyway, that's very cool. I I appreciate that perspective. That's very Tony Robbins, you know, I mean, look at that guy, like. I used to think, oh, he's just all about money and teach you how to get rich. Like, fuck that. It's vapid. But then you actually 
at least for me, experience some yeah. of his work and see all the things he's touching in the world, they would not be possible if he wasn't rich as hell. Right. right. You know? Exactly. So, yeah. And the people's lives that he changed. Yeah, it's, so, it's, it's yeah. insane. Well, cool, man. Um, where can people find your website, social media, et cetera? PaleoFX.com, PaleoFX on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and I, me personally, I am Be The Grace on Facebook, Be The Grace Women on Instagram and Twitter. Cool. And uh, ditto all of that. Um, I am Theory Number Two Practice on Instagram. Um, the very creative Keith Norris on Twitter and <laughs> <laughs> Facebook. Um, and I, I also still keep up with a blog, Theory to Practice blog. It's and that is at ancestralmomentum.com. And we won't even get into how that. <laughs> how that website name was created a whole other story but anyway i have a blog there cool man well thanks so much for joining me guys and it's been an amazing weekend and i'm so glad that you two were a part of it because you made it even that much more special oh well, thank you thank right. you so much for having us we yeah thanks it. for coming out to a first year event and taking a chance yeah because like, it oh man i would have it missed could it go it, it could go dicey right <laughs> I mean, first year events but uh Oh, man, what an event. Thank it's you very a, much for coming out yeah. and supporting. My absolute pleasure, man. It was a great opportunity and uh, and very fulfilling. And awesome. Yeah. Great. Thanks, you guys. Thank you.